This is the Friday, February 13th, 2015 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now is Mark Gold. Mark, welcome back. Nice to be back. And we're glad to have you. We've got a lot of a lot of great questions. We've got some diverse questions from our right. Twitter and Facebook followers this week. And I wanted to start with Rodney in Edgar, Wisconsin. He says he's heard that crude oil is on its way back down. Could that be true? Well, it certainly could be true. Is it true or not? You know, we've had a nice bounce here. We got down to $46, $47. Um, I've even, from my own personal account, bought, you know, crude oil. And when we had that bump up to 54 and changed, I took some profits out of that. And then we went back down again. I never rebought it again. But uh, I think there's some upside in this crude oil. It looks like it's trying to form a bottom in this market on the charts long term. I mean, we're on a fire sale in terms of these crude oil prices. I mean, there's predictions out there that we're going to $30 a barrel. And I think ultimately that's probably within reason. Uh, we're producing a lot of oil in this country. Demand's down. We've got all the alternative fuel sources. We've got cars running on you know, all kinds of different types of power out here. And we've got the mess that we've got in the Middle East. So I believe, you know, long term, crude oil is one of these commodities that has seen its heyday, in my opinion. And the trend and over, unless something explosive literally happens in the Middle East, that it's going to be lower. Now, does that mean in the meantime we can't see a jump in crude oil back to $61, $65? I think that's reasonable. These markets will trade. We'll have some rallies in this market. The high-frequency traders, the funds will get involved, and we can get some rallies out of this thing. So I'm not that bearish to crude oil right this minute. I think we can hold these lows here for a little while. Bearish but not not really bullish either. I mean, we are just trading in a lack of information right now. Yeah, I'd be much more of the frame of selling 10 and $15 rallies in the crude at this point. Uh, but can we get a $15 break? You bet. Okay. <laughs> Could be some, still is some risk out there. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Now, uh, we've got another question, and I thought this one was great. This is from Ryan in Orient, Iowa. He's curious, what happens first? $4 corn as it moves higher, or $4 ground beef as it drops lower? Which do you think is the faster moving market today? Well, I think right now the corn probably has more upside potential. The the beef prices haven't come down all that much, so, you know, I, I don't know that beef prices are going to fall out of bed, particularly with the American consumer having more money in his pocket today. But the corn prices of the funds, funds have done a fair job of liquidating out here. The American farmer is still long way too much corn. That's a Damocles sword that hangs over the market. But as we try to buy acres here in the next couple of weeks with these insurance levels, I believe that, you know, we can see some higher corn prices in here. So I'd be more inclined to think the corn has a better upside potential than the beef does a downside. Well, that's good to hear. And there's still uh, there's still been a, a, a solid amount of buying. Ground beef hit north of $5, yeah, I believe, yeah. here recently. So yeah, yeah. folks are still getting gearing up for burger season, I suppose. And, and why not? And, you know, you've got that extra disposable income. Those gas dollars make a big difference in this economy. So, again, you know, I kind of like the, uh, the corn market in terms of Moving higher. All right. Now we've got a question from uh, from Brian in Arlington Heights, and he's curious. As we talk about the soybean export potential, and it has been explosive all year, yeah. and we're we're well above USDA's uh, expectations by this point in time. He's curious. Can we outpace last year's soybean sales by 32 percent from the from this point in the year till the end of the marketing year, knowing that Brazilians crop Brazil's crop might be as much as seven million metric tons larger. Than, uh, than last year. Well, these continued exports through January and February have been a little bit of a surprise, including to me. You know, we keep sending a lot of beans out. We see these sales a million four, a million five, and so uh, it's been a lot stronger. Now, at some point, that does shut off in here. The Brazilians are getting the beans, they're getting them into port, they're getting them out of port, and there's a strong incentive for China to be looking to buy those beans. We keep waiting for these cancellations. About two weeks ago, we had a, one round of cancellations, but it was followed by a, a immediate sale almost the next day. So we haven't seen the backing off that one would expect. I'm still in the camp that there's going to be a big switch here, and when it does, our numbers are going to go to very small levels, and certainly that's a risk in this bean market. Now, when we start to see that switch, when we start to see those Chinese cancellations switch and officially transfer down to South America, how quickly do you think it will take the, the guys in Chicago to respond to that and start to push this down? Will it be? Instantaneously. Okay. You know, they're just waiting to see that. You know, they saw that first trip, 
So they started to pound it, the funds got out, and we've done a good job of liquidating the fund, long fund positions in the beans. Now there's a little, little bit of buying on a spec trade here for the funds, but if we see more cancellations, they're gonna pound it again. So in the meantime, until we see those cancellations, now if something happens, we don't get those cancellations, we continue to see huge numbers going out the door, that can be a factor that nobody's counting on in the bean market now. But can it happen? Sure. So again, if you're making some sales here, would I reown it with a call option? You bet. Okay. Now, one of the things that, and, and there's been a lot of talk about the potential downside risks in this soybean market, and there's been a lot of talk that it, as you mentioned, could be $2. Some analysts are saying, you know, more. 4 or 5 or more. And uh, we see these, every now and again, extreme price uh, <laughs> uh, predictions, yes. both to the upside and the downside. It, is it realistic? Do you think that th no. any of them could be sustained? You know, I get a kick out of listening. As much as I travel and hear people talk about these markets, you know, when we've got bull markets and droughts and tight carryouts, people talk, they throw out numbers, $25, $30 beans. I've heard one guy $12 corn, and then he went to $21 corn. And now you hear a lot of people talking about, we're going to be at $1.90 corn for five years. It's nonsense. Both the bull side and the bear side is nonsense. These markets are still subject to supply and demand, and supply and demand will rule these markets. And it's not to say over the next five years, with what we can grow today, that we can't have some pressure in agriculture. But every year, as long as I've been in the business, and I think going back to World War II, there's never been a year where you haven't had an opportunity to price grain above the cost of production. So you've got to look for those periods, and a dollar ninety corn for five years, in my opinion, is ludicrous. So you've got to take some of these statements with a grain of salt out here. If I was an American farmer, would I want to be in agriculture? You bet I would. The long term, feeding the world, and where we can go with this, it's been great. It's going to continue to be great. Yes, land prices might come down here a little bit. We could see some a year or two, maybe we could see this could be a tough year. If we grow another big crop with the world carryouts where they are, we're going to have a tough year. But then we'll force people out of production, demand will come back into the market, and these things will go back up again. Don't get caught up on these extremes that you hear out there from some of these analysts. Potentially a correction, not a depression. Exactly. You bet. Now, Mark, before we let you go, we had one final question from Josh in Chicago, and he's curious, what's your outlook for gold? Well, I assume he's talking about Solid gold and not me. Well, how are you uh, doing? <laughs> I'm doing fine. Uh, the gold market, we've had a pretty good break in here. We, we tested 1,300. We've broken it here in the last couple of weeks. Um, I'm a little surprised. Uh, I thought we'd see the stronger gold market in here. Uh, I've been trading some call options on the gold. Uh, the first one I bought did pretty well with it. Then I had another one uh, that I got out of. It took some money out and bought another one. That one's now lost its value, but we're down here to 1225. I still like the gold market down here. Um, I still like, in the long run, owning some tangible assets. I always tell people, they ask me, you know, should you own gold? And my answer is, in the long term, yes. You may never need that portable wealth or those gold coins, but I could almost guarantee you, anybody listening to us today, you may not need it, your kids not, might not need it, but by the time you get to your grandkids, somebody's going to need that gold that's sitting in a safe deposit box. And whether it's 2 ounces or 20 ounces or 50 ounces, whatever it is, I believe that gold's going to be very valuable someday in the future. All right. Well, Mark, we'll let you get out of here. Thanks for joining us this week. Thanks for having me again. We appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for sending in your questions via Facebook and Twitter. Please continue to do so. Get your friends to do so. And uh, we'll make sure the coffee talk, coffee shop talk is uh, higher brow. Very good. So have a great week, everybody.